Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us. This is Lad Keith, Assistant Professor in Planning and Chair of the Sustainable Built Environments Program at the University of Arizona. Thank you for joining our Extreme Heat Network webinar. I'm really excited to have Alex Ramirez of the Design Workshop and Catherine Burgess and Elizabeth Foster of the Urban Land Institute join us this month um, to discuss extreme heat and real estates. So the Extreme Heat Network really quickly is a community of research and practice on extreme heat hosted here at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. It started off from a small project and it's grown over the last year with the help of my um, graduate research assistant, um, Tess Wagner. And we have kind of expanded out of the Southwest and now have practitioners and researchers represented from across the world. So it's been exciting to see the growth and um, kind of learn more about what everyone's working on for extreme heat um, on the built environment side, on the health side, on the governance side. Um, so we're really excited to um, have everyone join us today and to share a little bit more about the real estate side of things from the Urban Land Institute's work. <clears throat> Next slide, Tess. So just a really quick thank you um, to CLEMIS, which is our climate assessment for the Southwest Center here at the University of Arizona. That's a RESA team, a regional integrated science assessment team that I'm affiliated with. I'd also like to thank the University of Arizona Center for Climate Adaptation Science and Solutions. Um, both of those centers are, uh, have been very helpful in supporting um, the growth of this network and uh, research on extreme heat. And uh, I was also reminded by Catherine Burgess that today is Earth Day, so that is not something that we um, plan to coincide with, but happy Earth Day. It is the 50th Earth Day, everyone, and I know we have a lot more work to do on uh, the environmental sustainability and resilience of our planet. But um, I know many of you joining us here today as I'm looking at the attendees box are doing um, really important work in that area. So thank you to all of you for your work in that too. Next slide, Tess. And just really quickly, I know the elephant in the room is COVID-19 and the coronavirus pandemic. So I'd just like to say again, thank you for joining us um, in these uncertain times. I know many of you are probably um, working from home. Um, if you're like me, you may have children running around in the background um, that you're trying to homeschool <laughs> while, uh, while attending this webinar, or you may be by yourself. So I do want to acknowledge that um, these are very uncertain times and uh, many of us are, uh, you know, experiencing something that we've never gone through before. Um, one really quick note is that um, I know a lot of cities and practitioners are looking for guidance on how to deal with extreme heat risk and COVID-19. And so I'd just like to mention that I'm also part of the Global Heat Health Information Network, and we are currently working on guidelines for cities and practitioners um, related to extreme heat risk and COVID-19. And those will be published um, very early in May 2020. It's currently going through a rapid peer review process. And so again, that will provide um, a little bit of guidance for cities on things like cooling centers, um, swimming pools, outdoor spaces, kind of uh, how to help those most vulnerable populations that may be at risk from both um, extreme heat and COVID-19. So, so if you do go ahead and um, we have uh, heat.arizona.edu website. And so uh, we will be posting updates on this important research there. And uh, if you subscribe to the Extreme Heat Network, we'll make sure to send out an announcement through that list too. Next slide, Tess. Just really quick webinar logistics and then we'll launch right into it to get to our speakers. So do use the Q&A functionality. Um, I'll moderate a couple of questions depending on how much time we have. So that's an important part of the webinars that we've been running is getting uh, questions from practitioners and researchers and then getting some answers from our speakers. So we'll be using the Q&A function for that. And then also uh, just to note, our recorded presentation will be available at heat.arizona.edu along with all of our past webinars and we've featured speakers on citizen science and extreme heat. We had uh, the Trust for Public Land in our last, um, in our last webinar talk about um, heat mapping across the United States. So, so there are past webinars that are currently to view too. And next slide, Tess. Great, and so with that, I will turn it over to Catherine Burgess and Elizabeth Foster at the Urban Land Institute. Thank you so much for joining us and I'll go ahead and mute myself and let you take it from here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lad, for having us. And thanks to everyone for making the time to join today and, uh, and hear both about our research on extreme heat and dive deeper on into an outstanding project that we'll hear about from Alex in the second half of the webinar. My name is Catherine Burgess, and I'm the VP for the Urban Resilience Program at the Urban Land Institute. Next slide. 
Before we get started with our recent extreme heat research initiative, I thought I'd share some of the big picture background about our program because I'd really welcome any ideas for further research opportunities and lines of inquiry from the listeners today, both relating to extreme heat and also relating to other types of climate risk and vulnerability. For those unaware, the Urban Land Institute is a global membership association of more than 40,000 professionals in the real estate, land use, and built environment industries. And it's very much an interdisciplinary group in which we're working together, uh, looking at our mission of providing leadership in the responsible use of land and in creating and sustaining thriving communities worldwide. We have more than 50 local district councils across North America, including an incredibly active chapter um, in Arizona. We also have national chapters in Europe and Asia who've been important collaborators on the international topic of climate change, climate risk, and climate resilience. Um, our membership is very much focused on the private sector perspective and offers a very pragmatic and implementation oriented view. We'll be eager to collaborate with others on the phone on topics related to resilience, climate risk, and land use. Something else I'll share too before we jump into the research today is that our resilience program is housed within our Center for Sustainability and Economic Performance, which also includes programs on building performance and health. It's been extremely helpful to collaborate with colleagues specialized in these related topics as we try to better understand how to measure and assess resilience issues. Given that high performance buildings and energy efficiency you know, has been measured and assessed for a long time and there's a clear business case for energy efficiency and sustainability um, at the um, asset level for buildings. With health, we're in increasingly seeing an interest in measurement, assessment, and metrics with standards and, and rating systems like fit well and well. Um, within resilience, as we all try to, to better understand what this very um, big picture topic can mean, it has been very helpful to look at the um, advances in those two areas. Next slide. Within our resilience program, we are primarily focused on climate resilience. So addressing how buildings, communities, and cities can be more prepared for the impacts of climate change. The work includes research, advising communities, so working closely with cities which have uh, technical questions around land user development strategy and looking for outside the box solutions, addressing policy or development opportunities. We also support local level resilience work initiated by our UGLI district councils. And we bring people together, both virtually, as we're all doing a lot more of now, and at um, national ULI meetings. Um, topic of resilience, you know, it's, it's one which has really grown in the time that ULI has chosen to focus on this topic. We established the program after Sandy, at which point the, much of the work was looking at how cities could be more prepared to bounce back from big interruptions and uh, storm events. Today, the program is now looking at all types of climate impacts, you know, including extreme heat as well as wildfire risk, drought, et cetera. And I think that mirrors the increased recognition of the industry, both um, looking at the, the climate risk that we all face and the, the public health risk and the need to, um, to be prepared for everything. Next slide, please. Before passing, this, before passing the mic to Liz Foster, who's going to to introduce um, some of our recent extreme heat research, I thought I would share a key theme around climate risk, climate change, and climate resilience, which is really driving the interests of much of our membership in real estate investment and development. Last year, we initiated a research partnership with the real estate investment manager, Heitman, which is a real estate investment manager based in Chicago with about $42 billion in assets under management. They're interested in better understanding how climate risk um, could be in could, uh, could be incorporated into the real estate investment decision-making process. The key focus of this research was looking at the different types of both physical and transitional risks related to climate change and how these risks are relevant to real estate. Physical risk relates to the, the physical damages which will occur on account of the impacts of climate change, both catastrophic events and the changes in weather patterns, which will lead to both business damages and business interruption, uh, potential changes in insurance availability. Um, potential uh, need for investment in different types of design and mitigation measures, both um, infrastructurally and um, within uh, um, on a building site. Transition risks are the, the bigger picture policy, legal, and regulatory changes which will occur over the long term and res as a result of climate change. Everything from increased policy and regulation, which can lead to a change in the cost of doing business, uh, different types of taxes in play, 
as well as market shifts, the potential for migration, uh, changed economic activity, and changed resource availability. Um, for, for much of our membership working in real estate, you know, looking at these types of risks, um, risk is, you know, risk is what real estate is all about, addressing risk and moving forward with, a, you know, with a, the pragmatic approach. And so this is a framework that we are seeing, um, that we are seeing gain increased interest amongst our membership, and he clearly fits in here um, in many of these categories. Um, if you're interested in learning more around our climate risk research, I'd encourage you to look up climate risk and real estate investment decision making. That's a 2019 publication and we will be putting out a follow up report later this summer. So with that, I'll um, turn the mic over to Liz to share our recent uh, recent report scorched extreme heat in real estate. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Catherine. So this is the voice of Elizabeth Foster. I'm a manager with ULI's Urban Resilience Program and along with Catherine, the co-author of Scorched Extreme Heat and Real Estate. Um, so I'm here today to share key findings from that research. I also wanna note that the full report, including case studies is freely and fully available at uli.org slash extreme heat. And we'd encourage you to um, read and share as widely as would be useful in your networks. Special thank you. Thank you to Lad Keith for hosting us today, as well as to Janice Barnes of Climate Adaptation Partners, who I think is attending, um, and we might call on both during the Q&A session. They were uh, reviewers of the entire 80-page report several times to make sure we got everything accurate, so a special shout out there. Next slide, please. So a quick definition of terms. When I say extreme heat, I'm talking about increasing temperatures from climate change, heat waves, and the urban heat island effect. So we focus on the urban heat island effect in the research and I'm going to focus on it in our conversation today because the UHI, the urban heat island effect has a tremendous impact on city temperature and there's a strong connection to real estate and land use. So that's what you see in the map on your screen. That's San Francisco in September of 2017 and it's a surface temperature map. And so you see that there's a huge temperature difference about 78 degrees Fahrenheit across the city that day during that heat wave. And what you'll notice in the patterns is that the areas of low temperature and the areas of high temperature strongly match areas of green space and areas of higher density development, demonstrating impact of land use on temperature and the relationship there. So we found in our research that there are four main connection points between urban heat islands and development. So land use change, waste heat emissions, air pollution and urban geometry, the actual texture and density of a city. And the cause and effect relationship between these factors and urban heat islands means that there's a significant opportunity for real estate and land use to both contribute less to raising temperatures in cities via mitigation methods, but as well as to proactively provide cool spaces of refuge. Um, so next slide, please. And this research does focus specifically on the United States and many of the examples today are from the US, although I think that there's a lot of general trends that are internationally as well. So in our research, we looked at a number of impact areas asking how dream heat impact real estate. And we found that overall the current and projected impacts of heat on people, on the economy, and on infrastructure are substantial. So especially with regard to structure, we're already seeing heat related impacts, not just in historically warm environments, but in historically more cool or more temperate environments. So for example, the largest blackout in the United States was in 2000, the Northeast blackout. It impacted eight states, about 50 people and caused about $10 million worth of damage. Now there was a cascading series that led to blackout, but the situation was made much worse by extreme temperatures at the time, and as well as by an increased demand for air conditioning, extra strain on, on local utility infrastructure. Early, Catherine and I are based in Washington, DC, and we're familiar with uh, commute slowdowns during periods of extreme temperature for safety reasons. Next slide, please, Tess. So we also looked more specifically at heat related economic influences on real estate. And one of the key factors or considerations that we heard in our research of over with over 50 subject matter experts is that consumer preference is key. And the idea is that extreme heat acts as a stressor. 
It changes consumer behavior. It changes spending patterns. It changes where people want to be and what they want to do. And that is an important consideration, especially for the real estate and land use sectors. The flip side of that, that play Places that are designed to comfortable temperatures are preferable. So an interesting example we came across in the research is that in Seattle, which is a historically cool environment without much air conditioning in its buildings, um, prior to about 2010, 6% of rental units in Seattle had air conditioning. Today, with a much more competitive rental market, as well as increased local temperatures for a number of factors, about 25% of rents have air conditioning. And so the change in preference and the in amenity expectations is a big consideration for folks in real estate. Some of the other impacts might be familiar to you and a little more intuitive in terms of business continuity, power up and interruptions, energy use, and um, potential increases in energy costs. Um, the last two, liability and regional, have question marks next to them because we heard these concerns in our research interviews, but we did not hear a consensus on if those concerns are widely occurring, and we did not hear that folks are making decisions based on them. So the idea that if professional standards for what a successful or underperforming building is shift, folks could be liable for not considering extreme heat or future climate change impacts. And then on the regional side, some speculation if the desirability of regional markets might change because of extreme heat. But again, no consensus on those two. Next slide, please. So it's worth noting that from the private real estate perspective, all of these impacts and potential risks are also opportunities for product differentiation. And we heard an awareness of both the positive and the negative side in our interviews. So a big takeaway from our research is that folks in private real estate are starting to look at extreme heat as its own hazard, not as a secondary concern for things like storm water management or energy efficiency. And the big motivation behind that is back to the consumer preference theme. It's not just about heat realities. There's also a significant impact on quality of life and making a high quality of experience is key for folks in real estate and it is as important as managing maybe operational cost risks. Next slide, please. So when we look kind of across the country at why folks were doing heat response movement, so developments that took into account local temperature risks and what they follow experience motivation is really tied to some of the other reasons we heard, which is um, planning efforts and efforts to really make sure, especially in um, west or southeast parts of the United States, where it's already really hot, that places remain comfortable for year-round use, including in the summer months. Um, this is also for real estate folks really tied to attracting tenants to their area or the tenants that have to attract top-level talent, especially in maybe Class A commercial office space. Um, or for a more public sector approach, simply just a development. Um, and excuse my slide formatting, the last bullet point there is operationals. And so what that looks like is we have folks acting from these concerns and acting from these motivations, both at the building and the site scale. So implementing specific typologies um, and building orientation strategies to limit solar heat gain, for example, or spending a lot of time and attention on the building envelope and materials or increasing ventilation. Things as simple as having operable windows where maybe in traditional design you wouldn't. We also heard folks across the board being very deliberate in their energy choices in the context of extreme heat. So everything from considering should they add mechanical air conditioning or cooling fans where maybe they wouldn't have traditionally on up to would it make business sense to connect those air conditioning and cooling systems to backup power sources and would that be financially viable. And then interestingly, we also he heard several stories of private sector real estate jumping in to experiment with emerging technologies. So we heard several times about folks investing in really functional art pieces that also provided a lot of shading, again, hearkening back to that placemaking as well as thermal comfort strategy. And we also heard of some folks investing in really emerging technologies such as reflective coating for pavements. So next slide, please. So 
All of these strategies cost money, um, but there's a number of business factors that make investing in heat responsive design from a business perspective worth it. Um, and so we heard from folks across the board from project development to operating buildings that there are financial benefits from considering heat in their development. So everything from faster permitting and increased buy-in from mutual stakeholders at the beginning to at the end, maybe experience asset value or higher rent premiums or just a faster lease up because of occupant interest in being. And as Catherine mentioned, there's also kind of a long-term interest in future proofing developments against having to make later changes and that um, in the real estate sector where projects are often done on a long time scale was a really influential factor. And so we're seeing an ROI, this return on investment, but the other important factor to keep in mind is that the most effective approaches to managing extreme heat from a temperature perspective, as well as an economic perspective, remain context specific. So we heard in a lot of our interviews that there's no one size fits all approach or outcome, even if the early signs are that being in heat aware, or heat resilient or heat um, conscious design are positive. Next slide, please. On the public side, we heard a similar trend of focusing on extreme heat um, and also a little bit of a shift from a historical approach in that typically cities and other and public public sector officials approached extreme heat from a public health or emergency response standpoint. And we started to hear them articulate um, it concerns more from a real estate and the land use perspective. So thinking about building codes or thinking about zoning changes. I do want to point out that equity was a concern for every single public official that we would uh, and I would encourage everybody to look at the maps that have come out in the last few months that very specifically compare redlining, which is a historic land use policy, to today's urban heat temperature maps, uh, excuse me, um, urban temperature maps in general. There's a lot of overlap and it's a very telling story. Next slide, please. So officials in the public realm are considering and implementing heat related mitigation and adaptation policy. So almost every public official we spoke to um, acknowledged expanding urban greening or urban canopy programs in their areas of influence. What we heard almost across the board too was that they knew equity resource allocation and decision making in those programs. One really interesting trend that we heard a little bit about was that public sector folks are starting to think about how to increase and ensure thermal comfort and safety in the residential sector. So ideas like, could you implement a maximum allowable temperature in the way that some places have implemented a minimal allowable temperature. And I just wanted to largely exploratory processes so far, but be kind of coming down the pipeline and it's something that might be on public officials minds. And another key takeaway we heard from public sector folks, a focus on social cohesion efforts, either leading or supporting them. And uh, to some of those equity concerns, but also to the fact that isolation is also a risk factor in heat related mortality. And so examples include San Francisco's Neighbor Fest, which is actually a pretty, it's like a giant block party that happens every year where it's actually organized in the incident command system and it encourages residents to form community connections to recognize both who to help them, um, but who might need help in time of crisis. And there's a lot of other examples from around the country cities um, taking action that you can read about in Scorched. Next slide, please. And the return on investment, the business case, if you will, for a city to invest in extreme heat mitigation and adaptation is in some ways much more well documented and quantified in private real estate. And so about things like decreased healthcare and emergency response costs, as well as increased equity outcomes. We're thinking about enhancing and maintaining economic equity. So back to those questions about spend their time, by extension, their money. And term sense, making sure remain attractive places to invest and attractive places to build. Next slide, please. So those are just some high takeaways from our research. And again, we're having questions on this uh, webinar 
or uh, contact information at the end. I do also want to share that we have a website called Developing Urban Resilience that is full of case study profiles, both of development projects as well as policies and programs that have climate resilience, including heat resilience, as a central component. And uh, here to our hosts, um, U of A is featured on that website. Um, you want to look for the ENR2 building. It was one of our earth that focused on extreme heat. Absolutely fantastic example of a number of building level mitigation and mitigation strategies that also a return on investment. So really encourage you all both to look at that as well as to contact us with any suggestions for projects that you may know that we could add to our library. Next slide, please. So that ends the summary of our scorched research, but I want to acknowledge, as Lad said at the beginning of this web, that gathering virtually here today in a really different context than normal. So we're also heading in a time when extreme heat and other environmental factors, such as hurricanes or wires, depending on where in the world, will worsen. And so if you haven't seen it already, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention released guidance on how to manage cooling centers in the context of Corona. So I know that LAD and his heat and health networks are aware of this and take consideration, but I wanted to as a resource as well. So next slide, please. And for me, this emphasizes that one of our key takeaways from the research is that real estate and land use has a significant role to play here. There are very immediate and real ways in infrastructure and our real estate and our resilience planning can help both limit harm and also provide areas of relief during times of crisis. So again, thank you so much for joining us here today. We're happy to take questions um, either now or at the email address you see listed, resilience at uli.org. Great. Thank you so much, Liz and Catherine, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions that I think I'm going to save for after Alex because he is going to present um, kind of a more site-specific um, view that may get at some of the questions that are being asked. But do continue to populate the Q&A um, if, if you have questions either on what you've just heard or kind of what comes up with Alex. One, one question that I would like to ask um, Catherine and Liz that was forwarded to me is, um, so through your research for the Scorched Report, um, what types of information uh, would did you hear was lacking for people to make decisions on extreme heat, whether it's on the real estate side or the governance side? And so we have a really good mix of practitioners and researchers um, joining us today. And I know that some of those researchers are um, trying to answer some of these questions. So, so what kind of information was um, needed to make better decisions in the area of extreme heat? Either Catherine or Liz, if you want to take that one. Sure, a lot I can join, Catherine, if you want to. It, it's only a little bit of a cop out to say, I think what folks were really looking for were the numbers and sort of the business case notes and wondering about, frankly, the return on investment. And there's a lot of really good research out there from the public sector side that has attempted to quantify this um, resource from capital E investment in DC that we could specifically, as well as from the Cool Cities Alliance on this. They've looked briefly on the public sector side, but on the private, those numbers are readily available. And I think that they're also a little challenging to do because the strategies that are context specific, so what is the most effective strategy from a temperature point of view is going where you are in terms of your climate factors, your heat and your humidity uh, appropriate. It's difficult with, I think, all environmental, but especially with extreme heat, to sometimes make generalizations. And so the more that folks start to do these heat responsive developments and the more track and share their results, I think the stronger that case will be, there will be more information there for folks to understand how to meld their resilience and their business goals. So Catherine, I don't know if you'd like to add to that. Yeah. I think, uh, thanks Liz, I thought that's a great response. Something I would add as well is, um, and also a plug for a project we will be um, publishing this summer, is, you know, there is increasingly data available around the physical risk 
that, um, you know, that is faced at any particular site. And many of our ULI members are working with third party data providers to map their real estate portfolios and look at you know, what the likely long term heat stress, flood, um, flood risk, et cetera, is on a site by site basis. Um, but this type of mapping, you know, it, it's looking just at the vulnerability without an overlay of what difference can be made with the um, asset level resilience, uh, resilient design interventions, as well as with um, infrastructure or um, land use strategies. So I think what we're really hearing, um, you know, the call for in our membership is, uh, you know, overlays of this different type of data. And there's obviously a lot of innovation in this space. So it, you know, we're moving closer to that every day. Um, one project which we worked on, which addressed this question to some degree, uh, and which we'll be publishing this summer as a collaboration with ULI New York and the New York Institute of Technology, looking at a potential rezoning in a part of Brooklyn that um, is very park poor and had, um, you know, really facing extreme heat challenges already, let alone, um, you know, in future climates. Um, and in that case, um, we we're actually doing some modeling projects looking at the future temperature scenarios, considering both uh, climate issues and the potential um, built environment strategies um, to address heat and the different uh, potential um, densities that could um, move forward with the rezoning. So I think um, studies like that can both help inform policymakers what um, types of requirements and incentives should be built in and um, also help the, the design professionals and developers. Great, thank you so much. Um, let's move on to Alex and his presentation, and then I will try to we'll try to get to as many questions as we can within the hours they keep coming in. So, Alex, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks. Um, my name is Alex Ramirez. I work at the Design Workshop here in Houston, Texas. You can go to the next slide. Hey, Alex, are you there? It looks like Alex's call dropped, which is something that does happen as we're all learning in the Zoom era <laughs> uh, webinars and meetings. So let me go ahead and um, ask one more question to Liz and Catherine while he is rejoining us. Um, one, one question that I get asked quite a bit too, and I, I pursue in my own research, but for Catherine and Liz, have you seen any examples of extreme heat mitigation being built into local zoning and building codes? That's a great question. One, I haven't seen anything actually enacted yet. Um, one interesting project I did hear is happening um, in Richmond, Virginia, we talked to a group there that is in the middle of updating those building codes and they are can they have also done a lot of work um, to map temperature extremes in their city, as well as and where instances of heat related occur. Um, and they are thinking through right now and if to change their zoning based on that and heard of several similar thought processes going on in other areas. Um, I'm not aware if any of them have wrapped up yet. Great okay. question. And I think that we will probably see more of that being heard. Yeah. I would add as well, my understanding is that Miami Beach is adding some zoning overlay language around extreme heat. I think this is a scenario where we have a municipality that is extremely proactive on climate resilience overall, you know, facing the extreme threat of sea level rise and storm surge and groundwater issues. Um, so that is um, one municipality to keep an eye on. Okay, one related question that um, kind of goes down this path a little bit further. Um, so the acknowledgement from uh, um, one of the participants that to reduce urban heat island effect, um, we really need to look at regional collective action. Obviously all of these um, are implemented at the site level. Um, but what types of policies and regulations 
have you heard that the real estate industry could accept to achieve this collective action needed to mitigate urban heat? It's a really great question. Um, from the research that I did, the regional thinking um, in terms of policies saw mostly coming in the desktop research. Um, we saw some really interesting academic and scientific research thinking of regional impacts. Um, so I know there are a lot of cities that are working um, to mitigate extreme temperatures across a city as a whole. So for example, um, cities like Melbourne and Los Angeles that have set temperature reduction goals for their city, um, which is a fairly significant commitment. Um, I, I personally don't know if there is coordination across cities, but if anybody here on the webinar is aware of it, I'd love to know about it. Um, and I'd love it if you would uh, comment that in the chat and we could maybe um, figure to tell that story. Great, thank you. I think we have Alex back. Do you want to take it from here, Alex? Sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. I apologize. I don't know what happened. Um, anyway, my name is Alex Ramirez. I work at Design Workshop uh, here in Houston, Texas. Uh, I'll first tell you a little bit about Design Workshop. Um, we are a landscape architecture, urban design, and planning firm. Uh, we have eight offices around the country, um, East Coast to West Coast, with so two offices here in Texas. Uh, I've had the good fortune to work in both of those offices. I started in our Austin office where we did this project that I'll speak about today, and then moved uh, to our Houston office where I've been for the past four years or so, um, overseeing some uh, construction of a couple other big projects. Um, so today we'll talk a little bit about Bagby Street, um, and uh, we did this work in conjunction with the Midtown Redevelopment Authority, and I'll tell you guys a little bit more about them as we go on. So um, before I get too far into Bagby Street, though, I do want to tell you uh, a little bit about design workshop in our process and how we set up our projects. Uh, it'll make the rest of the presentation uh, more understandable. So I'll, I'll start with that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that design workshop, we've developed what we call legacy design and what we think of, uh, we really think of this as a comprehensive approach to planning and design uh, where we aim to deliver measurable project outcomes in these four categories of environment, economics, community, and art. And really what this does is sort of broaden the concept of the triple bottom line um, by adding art into that fold um, being the fourth element. Um, and we really feel like when all of these things are in balance is when we do our best work. And as we go through the rest of these slides, uh, you'll see how those things come into play with one another. Um, but it's all working towards, um, you know, this, this idea of measurable outcomes to, to benefit the project and to craft a narrative for a given project. Next slide. So when we uh, start any project that we do, we typically start um, with the strategic kickoff meeting, both internally as a project team and externally with our client teams. And really what we're trying to do is, is um, get an understanding of where everybody is with the project. And when we walk into a room, typically everybody has a little bit different idea about their understanding of the project or what they even want out of the project. But it's important for us to have these meetings to set the tone for the project um, through a transparent and inclusive process. Next slide. So what we're trying to do is really create alignment. Uh, so in this meeting, we're talking about all the, the details, uh, the nitty gritty details. Um, we talk a lot about goals and client critical success factors. Um, we critical success factors to us are the things that must happen in that project in order for that client to feel like it was successful. Um, so what's really about getting, making sure everybody's on the same page and, and getting alignment um, with everybody involved. Next slide. So what we're trying to do, you know, in that meeting is we're identifying goals and trying to get an understanding of where the project should go. Um, the next step for us in our process is to identify uh, and discover those goals through what these, like what we call our legacy uh, design metrics. Um, and so what we do is the, we actually have, every office has these sheets uh, printed out full size. Um, they're huge. And they're really, a, what they are is a tool for us to begin that conversation and to understand how we're going to track this project. Um, so all but the idea that all of these are working towards the to the to facilitate and meet the goals of the client. Uh, next slide. 
And so what those clean drawings turn into is this. And basically what this is is a brainstorming exercise. How do we how do we meet the goals of the client? What sections of each of those uh, legacy design realms are we going to focus on? And how will that benefit the project in the end? Next slide. So what this process equates to from our perspective is what we call performance-based design. And it's just the idea that there's measurable outcomes for our design solutions uh, that really help craft the narrative of the project and what we hope remains as the legacy of the project um, as they get completed. Baggy Street's a pretty good example of that. Uh, we started our Baggy Street project 10 years ago, uh, and we're, you know, we're very fortunate to be able to speaking with you guys today about that project. Uh, so what we did, these are what some of the goals of the Baggy Street project itself. Again, we're, we're focusing on each one of those rounds of legacy design to make sure that we're focusing um, not too much on one um, and not enough on the other. Next slide. So the first step in the, for this idea of performance-based design is capturing the baseline conditions. And so when we start a project and we're doing our site visits, we're actually going to the site with what we call a legacy design backpack. And in that backpack, we have a range of tools. So these are some of the ones that have included here. So we're measuring surface temperatures. We're understanding how loud and noisy some of these places are. We're getting light readings to understand um, what how safety might be uh, perceived on site. Is it too dark? Is it too light? Um, we're also, you know, taking soil samples. We're measuring. Um, we're, we're capturing a bunch of baseline conditions to get an understanding of where our project is right now. That will allow us to better define our goals and to reach our goals, you know, in the future of the project. Next slide. So we'll get into the project now. Uh, so Baggy Street is located in the Midtown District um, in Houston. The Midtown District, you can see there, is located between downtown Houston and uh, the Museum and Medical District, which are two of the largest employment hubs in the city. Um, the Midtown District itself was previously made up of the Third Ward and the Fourth Ward. Um, but really, um, you know, in its recent history, Midtown has seen a resurgence of people coming back into the city and wanting to live, work, and play in the same district, in the same area. So Baggy Street is a 12-block reconstruction project um, located in this district here on the west side. And if you see that little dashed blue line, uh, one of the reasons why this project was chosen was because um, uh, the city had identified Baggy Street as a corridor uh, to do drainage improvements. And ultimately, these drainage improvements lead to Buffalo Bayou. And if you're familiar with Houston at all, you've probably heard of Buffalo Bayou, um, sort of a major corridor um, um, in, the, in the city proper. Um, the Baggy Street has, you know, really been seen um, as a commuter thoroughfare. Um, and so it's been challenging, and I'll get into this a little bit later, um, but it's been challenging, it was a challenging dilemma to deal with, you know, pressure from the city and this idea of a drainage improvement project, but ultimately what our client wanted to do. Uh, next slide. Uh, so historically, Baggy Street was a four-lane corridor um, with pretty low traffic volumes considering how wide the street was. Um, this supported the, the city's major thoroughfare plan, but our client had a different idea about how that, how that corridor could be utilized. And, and, and knowing that there was a drainage project identified, our client went to the city and said, hey, can we think about this in a little bit different way? And so fortunately, we were able to get involved with the project and craft a different narrative for this corridor. Next slide. So as I talked about, we have a two different competing interests here. You have this idea of a livable center creating a walkable environment that's really catered to the pedestrian. But the, 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 you also have this idea of a commuter thoroughfare from the city's standpoint. And those things really combat one another. Um, and this idea of a commuter thoroughfare limits the potential for reinvestment in Midtown. Um, and so the idea was that by creating quality systems, you know, and making sure all the systems are focusing at their maximum efficiency, we can actually do both. And so by doing that, we are able to create a different type of corridor than what was originally thought of. Next slide. So like many projects, you know, we always start with site analysis. Uh, so these are some of the systems that we looked at. You know, obviously tree health was important. Um, utilities, circulation, land use, certainly. Um, 
many other things that you can't really see here, you know, this idea of the heat island effect, crosswalk distances, on-street parking, light levels, and just walking distances to, to um, bars and restaurants and the entertainment that is uh, prevalent in the district. Next slide. And understanding all those components and how those work together was, was vital for the project. Um, and as Liz mentioned earlier, this can't be something that's a one-size-fits-all solution. It has to be done with context, context sensitivity. And so as we were going through this uh, analysis, we started identifying, started identifying blocks where we saw that there was potential for return on investment. And that's where we were able to focus some of our higher uh, finishes um, and sort of direct um, where those things went as opposed to other blocks. So this idea is that you're responding to the adjacent land use in the best way for all of your finishes uh, throughout the corridor. Okay, next slide. So ultimately what we ended up with is this idea for a green street. Um, so as I mentioned previously, uh, automobile dominated a corridor we sort of flipped the script and said, we got to give this pedestrian, uh, or we have to give the right of way back to the pedestrian. And so we sort of envisioned this green, this green street where we've introduced rain gardens, we've introduced more seating areas, we've expanded the pedestrian realm so the pedestrian has the ability to take over more of the, the right of way than what was previously provided. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, Here's some of the built imagery, sorry, previous slide. <laughs> Here's some of the built imagery of what the ultimate project ended up being. And as a result of the work that we've done, what you can see here is that the private private uh, redevelopment has come in and has really focused themselves on some of these blocks. So what we've seen since the project was announced is, uh, you know, just approximately $53 million of reinvestment um, on, on the corridor itself. What we've also seen is that there's a 26% increase in the rental property. Next slide. Um, we also I mentioned about you know flipping the script from going to four-lane thoroughfare to a two-lane uh, to a two-lane thoroughfare. By doing so, we've almost tripled the amount of, of, of space dedicated to pedestrians. So we have much wider planting areas. Uh, we have much wider sidewalks that better accommodate. Um, the pedestrians walking up and down the corridor, the folks who live on the corridor, and this idea of being able to walk and commute um, to bars and restaurants located along the corridor. Next slide. So uh, this idea of converting from four lanes to two lanes, we, we sort of call we called it a road diet. Um, it was the idea that we had periodic turn lanes when needed. Um, what we found in sort of a post mortem of this. As we, after we did some more research is the throughput of this corridor actually became more efficient and was better than what the previous conditions were, even with you know half the amount of travel lanes located along the corridor. And so um, here's a couple more metrics that we, we captured throughout this process. Um, you know, we've increased the available organic soils for the trees by 42%, which ultimately will allow those trees to continue growing and expanding and ultimately shade the corridor. And uh, we also introduced the fly ash into our concrete spec, which helped offset uh, 300 tons of, of carbon during construction. Next slide. A major component of the Baggage Street Corridor was the introduction of these rain gardens. This was a completely new idea in, in the city of Houston, and it took a lot of uh, time to, to, for everybody and all the uh, departments to get around this idea. Um, but what we were able to do, because there was a, a conversation happening with the drainage project and this idea that we needed to improve drainage. And so let's do that in a little bit different way and let's bring that to light and let it be appreciated by the folks in the district. And so what we're able to do with these rain gardens is take water offline for a period of time and actually return better water to Buffalo Bayou um, as, it, as it enters that system. And so what we're able to do with these rain gardens is actually able to capture 100% of the two year storm um, in these rain gardens. And we're able to also capture 33% of the total local stormwater that falls on any given rain event. And through these rain gardens, we're treating water. And here's just a, a quick breakdown of some of those um, the elements we're able to treat uh, to, to produce a better water quality. 
Next slide. Again, as a part of the context-sensitive design approach, not every block was able to accept uh, rain gardens. Obviously, we had several blocks that had large existing trees that were on site that greatly contributed to this idea of human comfort and allowing a shaded corridor uh, to be maintained. What we did do is make sure, um, you know, we had pedestrian sidewalks in every location, make sure they're wide enough to accommodate pedestrian. We also uh, increased the new the capacity to proceeding and gathering in these shaded areas um, by 30, uh, 38%. Um, and so what we see overall is that maturity when all of the, the street trees do grow in, the, the new trees that we planted, that there will be about 88% of the corridor that's shaded with tree canopy. Next slide. So um, strategically located at a, at a high pedestrian traffic area, we provided this kiosk as a way to help people understand what was actually happening. And so this, we're trying to introduce um, this idea of environmental graphics into the landscape so people can get a better understanding and appreciation for the systems that they're actually seeing. And so what this does is educates the, the general public about what's happening. Uh, some of the, one of the fun details that we incorporated was actually sandblasting the total um, volume of gallons the, 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 these rain gardens could treat, um, which ultimately, if you add them all up, contributes to more than 400,000 gallons of stormwater that can be captured and treated. Next slide. Another big component of the project was actually establishing a brand for the Midtown District. And so we're able to identify key finishes um, that help build that brand. And what we've done on subsequent projects is, is build on that brand. So we're using materials um, that have a high SRI content. We're salvaging materials when possible. Um, we're, we're utilizing um, key materials and key locations to best accommodate um, the, the right of way in the, in the corridor and as it relates to the, to the land use. So not every area, again, has very wide sidewalks have seating elements, but these are all context sensitive design solutions that work to the ultimate goal of the project. Next slide. So the Badger Street um, reconstruction project sort of established a new benchmark for streets within the city of Houston and beyond. And the, the mayor actually um, at the at the groundbreaking uh, started an executive order that's changed the way the city deals with street projects in, in, in the city of Houston and basically forces the, the departments to, to take a more rigorous look and understanding at, at these street improvements and what they are doing for the city. Uh, at the time that the Baggy Street was constructed and completed, it was the highest um, score in Green Road certified project in the country and it was for several years until a couple years ago a project in Portland actually beat us out. Um, but her client um, has this idea of a, a couplet to Baggy Street being Brazo Street, and that project should be getting started another year. They're saying we got to be back on top. So it's an exciting uh, thought to, to, to be able to get into something like this again. Next slide. One of the small detail I wanted to mention here is that um, Bagger Street um, was part as part of the landscape architecture foundation case study investigation series or this landscape performance series that you see here these happen to actually be all of our projects which if you go to the landscape architecture foundation website you can actually get to the bagby street case study that was done and you can read up and, and look on some more details uh, associated with that project next slide that's it thank you Great, thank you so much for the presentation, Alex. It really um, kind of uh, puts a lot of what Elizabeth and Catherine had talked about in a very concrete way to see how it can be implemented at the local level. And um, we're almost at the top of the hour, so I want to make sure we respect everyone's um, time and end on time. But Alex, how, um, just super quickly, how um, did the experience of this project, um, will it make you look forward at uh, future projects and how will you, how will you and other um, you know, private sector folks uh, consider extreme heat as you kind of move forward. It's a very important and relevant topic. You know, there's a there's a lot of push right now to to get outdoors and stay outdoors, and the outdoor environment doing so much for the mental health of these communities. And so, if we can help offset 
the effects of the extreme heat by increasing human comfort, by adding our shade trees and giving folks a place of respite is, is only underlined in, in, the, in the work that we can do as landscape architects. Um, the project, this last slide actually has an image of another project that we just completed that has some of the same principles. It has bioswale, it has rain gardens. Um, it's maintained, you know, these, this idea of uh, large trees and, and getting folks uh, into a place in a green space that, that they can feel relieved of that heat. One of the details I didn't mention as part of the, the case study and, and part of our research was that just by being in shade, there's about a 20 degree difference in ambient air temperature. Um, you know, when using, when standing in shade. And so it just, it, it can't be understated enough um, that we have to be able to provide a comfortable environment for these folks to, to live, work, and play in. And with the idea of mo people moving back into urban communities and densifying this as the city densifies, it's only going to be more important to make sure that urban canopy exists. Great. Thank you so much. Tess, if you could go to the next slide and we'll wrap things up. Great. Well, thank you again to Alex, Catherine, and Elizabeth for the wonderful presentation today. Um, really appreciate the time that you put into the presentation and then the questions and answers that you've, uh, the answers that you've been giving to all the participants. Um, just again, for those joining us for the first time, please do uh, check out heat.arizona.edu for future webinars and to subscribe for future updates. And again, we will post that important guidance for COVID-19 and extreme heat. And if anybody has any questions on how to get involved, uh, please feel reach out to me at lad, L-A-D-D, at arizona.edu. Thanks again, and hope everyone has a happy Earth Day, and hope everyone is staying uh, safe and healthy at home. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.